So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Oketch. I'm a quality advocate with ThoughtWorks. And today, I'm going to talk about observability that, uh, that matters. <clears throat> but first, does anyone know what type of plane this is? I'll give you a hint. It's not the Boeing 737 MAX. <laughs> but it's also made by Boeing. Um, this is the, the, Boeing 7, uh, the Boeing B-17, also known as the Flying Fortress. It's the third most produced bomber of all time, and it was a very popular choice of aircraft for the US Army in the Second World War. Do you know what else it was popular for? Getting shot at by the Germans. But more so it was popular because it was tough. Despite consistently getting shot at, most B-17s were able to return safely to base, uh, regardless of the heavy damage. Even then, that was not good enough for the US Army. So in 1943, the US Army came to this man, uh, Abraham Wald. Wald was a renowned mathematician. He held a professorship uh, in statistics at the University of Columbia at that time. So the US Army needed his advice on improvements that they were planning on making to the planes so that they could reduce their losses. So the, the Army had already run some analysis uh, of where their planes were getting shot up, and they came up with this. And in case you're wondering, the red dots are basically where the shots were landing. So they knew they needed to add armor to those spots, and it was mostly around the fuselage. The problem, though, is that if you think about it, armor is actually heavy, right? So if you add too much of it, then uh, the plane becomes less agile, and it also requires more fuel, right? But then if you don't add enough, um, you know, bad things happen. So what they really needed to do was um, find an optimum amount of armor to add, which is not too little, but not too much, which is precisely the kind of problem that you bring to a mathematician like Abraham Wald. But the response they got from Wald was not what they expected. Abraham Wald said they should instead add armor to these areas, right? which is crazy because if you think about it, the areas you looked at were the nose, the engines, the mid-body, and that's not where the shots were landing. But Abraham realized what the others did not. The planes were getting shot there too, but those planes were not actually making it back to the base. So why do I bring this up? As technology leaders, we're faced with a very similar scenario on a daily basis. When building and operating our systems, we have to make trade-offs between you know, anything, between cost, time, quality, features. And whether we realize it or not, we're, we're making hypotheses around which feature or which bug fix or which optimization provides the most value uh, and directing our teams towards that. But sometimes, as in the example above, we may not have all the information or context to make the right decisions. This is especially problematic because the systems we're building are becoming increasingly complex. Uh, they're spanning multiple distributed systems, multiple clouds, uh, multiple architectures, hybrid environments, polygon persistence, and so much more. So it's not always easy or straightforward to grasp how our systems are working uh, or not working and how the changes we make affect these systems. Thankfully, observability promises to help us out. So what is observability? Um, observability is a measure of how well the internal states of a system can be understood by examining its outputs. It's actually a term that originated from control theory. And the general idea is that if we can capture and analyze data from our systems about the operation, then we should be able to understand how they are working. So what kind of data is this? Um, the kind of data that you typically look at, and sometimes you call them signals, uh, usually falls in three categories, uh, logs, metrics, and traces. And you'll hear people refer to these as the three pillars of observability. So let me just de uh, describe them very briefly. Logs are probably the most familiar. They represent discrete events uh, with context about what has happened in your system. Generally, if you get the most value out of them, uh, they're aggregated for further analysis. 
And then metrics, on the other hand, tend to give up uh, most of the context uh, carried by logs in exchange for friendlier storage and faster querying. They typically represent data that is pre-aggregated and measured in intervals of time. So think of things like request rates, um, error rate, duration of response, and so on. And then the last category would be distributed traces, which um, enable you to uh, reconstruct journeys of transactions across a distributed system. So it typically works by assigning external IDs to uh, incoming requests, and then propagating that unique identifier across all the services handling uh, involved in that request. So when you look at most of the information around, it tells you that in theory, once you have these three pillars and are able to search and sift through them, then you should have observability and you should be able to understand how your systems are working, no matter how complex they are. But in reality, theory and practice don't always align. And this is especially true if you've gotten caught up in any of the following anti-patterns. So the first such anti-pattern is what I call an obsession with tooling. And it's this idea that you can just set up a bunch of tools and get observability in return. So some of the symptoms of this are the, like a mindless pursuit of the perfect tooling for observability, which you're never going to find, and often just becomes a barrier to getting started. Um, and then the second is this, the endless addition of tools to your observability suite as a way to plug perceived gaps in understanding. Now, I know you might be thinking, uh, if you look at this slide, and it's intentionally very busy, this is just the list of tools that are tracked by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation under the category observability, and there are so many. So am I saying that you should not seek out good tools to use? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is that chasing after tooling fast, uh, if we do that, then we basically forget that tooling should actually be used to support people and not the other way around. Um, there's a quote from uh, Mike Julian in his book on practical monitoring where he says, there is no such thing as this single pane of glass tool that uh, will suddenly provide you perfect visibility into your network servers and applications, all with little to no tuning or investment of stuff. Many vendors sell this idea, but it's a myth, and it's a very profitable one. So how can you resolve this? Um, I would say definitely start somewhere. You still need tooling. But rather than focusing on the tooling, focus on empowering and educating the people on your teams uh, on what kind of questions they need to ask of their systems. If you do that, then, uh, and, and your people have a good grasp of uh, the kind of questions they, they need to ask, then they will no doubt identify tooling that will support their goals. Um, and then if you really want to have a handle on the tooling that you, you use, uh, wherever possible, opt for open standards such as open telemetry so that you can avoid vendor lock-in. And then you can also consider the concept of an observability pipeline, which is another talk. The second anti-pattern is what I call venture observability. And it's this idea that observability is this thing that you can just bolt onto your system after the fact. This is typically exhibited in two ways. Uh, one is having no forethought into making observable uh, systems, making systems observable during development. And then second, treating observability as a feature, which is something that you can prioritize or deprioritize as needed. But if you think about it, there is no one who is better suited to building observability into your system than your developers, the people actually building the system, because they are the ones who actually understand it the most. So attempting to outsource this to an overpriced quotes product after the fact will not work. So how do you change this? Um, there's a couple of ways. Uh, make observability a first class concern. Uh, encourage your developers to expose useful telemetry data during the development process. And then don't even wait for prod. Use observability during development. Start to learn from your system even before you ship to production. Um, the third anti-pattern is uh, this idea that observability is an end goal in and of itself. And I find that this is typically the result of some kind of middle management decree. So some of the symptoms of this are having no, higher, no prescribed higher level goals, no correlation between system understanding, uh, better system understanding and the user or business needs. Because the truth is that 
as much as we talk about observability and it's a big deal, there is no value in pursuing observability for the sake of it. It's not an end goal. Rather, we have to be focused on what our business and users care about and on the quality of the services that we need to deliver. Observability itself is just a means to help us to achieve this. And a good way to think about this uh, for me is to look at how we typically build and operate our software, uh, our systems, usually operating under one of two modes, optimization or firefighting, right? So firefighting, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's a high-stakes situation where you have a failing SLI and need to rapidly restore it, often under intense pressure, and probably most of us have been in this scenario. Um, optimization, on the other hand, is uh, when you have stable SLIs and need to improve them, usually gradually. Um, so in the one case, observability should help you find the information you need as fast as possible. In the other case, you, observability should help you build as complete and accurate a picture as possible of the system uh, that you're uh, interested in. Now, if you find that you cannot achieve either of these goals, then you don't have an observable system. So what are the remedies? I would say, firstly, identify SLIs and SLOs for your system, and then use observability to support your business and user needs as measured by your SLOs. And I'll end with this. I know I'm running up, uh, a bit over time. Um, if you look at our industry as a whole, I believe the systems we're building are just going to get even more complex. While we have been incredibly focused on how to build and operate these systems, uh, I think we now need to also apply the same level of discipline uh, to understanding how these systems work. Without uh, observability is definitely one thing that is going to help us out uh, in, in this way, uh, by giving us feedback loops in, into how these systems are actually behaving when we let them loose in the wild. Without this feedback loop, we will not be able to build better software. Um, but at the end of the day, observability has to serve the goals of your business. So just to end this, uh, don't do the things at the top. Uh, do the things at the bottom. Thank you. <laughs>